Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Ash by James Herbert. So this is the third book in the David Ash trilogy, it's also the final book that Herbert wrote. Uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads, Fear will let you in, terror will keep you there. They were miscreants with black souls roaming the corridors and passageways. Infamous people thought long deceased, hiding and nurturing their evil in a basement full of secrets so shocking they would shake the world if they were ever revealed. David Ash, ghost hunter and parapsychologist, arrives at Comrade Castle, a desolate ancient place with a dark heart, to investigate a series of disturbing events. An incorporeal power has been ignited by a long ago curse, fed and now unleashed by the evil of those who once inhabited this supposed sanctuary, and by some who still do. Yet their hour of retribution is at hand. Ash, James Herbert's most controversial novel to date, will make you wonder what is fact and what is fiction. I mean, it's predominantly fiction. So we have here, it starts with a, a quote, it says, There are dark forces at work in this country about which we know little. Queen Elizabeth II, allegedly. Uh, and then it goes into <laughs> Princess Diana's death. So that's like the first... The first... Um, seen in this. So yeah, we're going to move on a little bit to David Ash uh, being asked to take on this uh, this case. So they're talking about the castle and uh, Ash was perplexed. How can you keep that kind of landmark secret? How about the locals? They must be aware of its existence. Oh, they know Comrec is there alright, but they have no idea of its purpose. We encourage them to believe it's been turned into a private and very expensive health spa. In some ways, it is just that. As for tradesmen and deliveries of any kind, there is a dropping off point at the estate's boundary. Mr. Ash, once you're there, you'll appreciate its need for secrecy. And um, so he, he heads off to get on a plane to go to Scotland to investigate this. And he takes a call while he's, while he's on the plane from Kate, which is like his boss slash business partner. Um, and she goes, where are you? Where I'm supposed to be. Good, you made it. What did you expect? Just checking, David. I know you're hopeless with mornings. And then he goes, daylight burns. I agree with him. And so uh, this is the start of a chapter that focuses on Kate, um, David's business partner. Um, and I just thought this was a nice little interesting bit of, sort of helping to set the scene. Kate sat at her desk, her swivel chair turned to face one of the tall windows of her office. Beyond the glass it was yet another fine early autumnal day, although nippy in the streets. She usually got to the institute around 8am, which gave her quiet time to deal with the paperwork, the government rules, red tape and health and safety directives. There was every employer's bane. By the, time other, by the time other staff arrived and things started to get busy, she would be able to concentrate on her proper duties, which meant sending and checking emails, making and receiving phone calls, writing reports on any supernatural or paranormal activities that had come to the Institute's notice, genuine or suspect, which would then be filed and copies sent to other psychical research establishments around the world. She believed in sharing information with those who were both friendly and legitimate, while taking on board any new accounts of phenomena and interviewing prospective clients. She'd no idea why, but people seemed more susceptible to hauntings when the days grew colder and the darkness earlier. I imagine that's true. We learn that Comrec means uh, sanctuary, and we also get a use, use of the, the word half-jokingly, which just bothers me. And we get a little, little reference to the phenomenon of uh, synchronicity, which I just find interesting. The idea of, I guess, coincis and coincidences. I'm not going to go into what synchronicity is, it's kind of hard to de define it, I guess. And uh, we get this line, so Ash is being sort of wined and dined by the client, and, it, and he goes, uh, food had never been a priority in his life. He ate to live, not vice versa. But when he read the selections, his mouth began to salivate. I would say I eat to live and, vice, and not vice versa as well. And we get uh, Ash reflecting what happened to him after the events of The Ghost of Sleeth, which was the last book. He remembered that when he removed himself from the mental health wing of a London hospital a couple of years ago, they had insisted that he remain on fluoxetine, which was just another brand of Prozac apparently, and amitriptyline hydrochloride, just at least till the night terrors had stopped. Those nightmare attacks continued to plague him, but only occasionally. I'm on amitriptyline as well. And uh, he discovers that one of the people that's at the castle is Lord Lucan, who was quite a famous uh, figure in British history. He disappeared and the mystery never really got solved. And um, Victor Hailstrom, who's kind of the boss of this facility, um, he's talking about 
the burden of proof they have to prove that their uh, patients are still alive. They're not allowed visitors from the outside or anything. He says, each year we have to provide proof of life as we do for all our guests at Comrec. Benev benevolent or expedient our guest patrons may be, but they are not foolish. Unless the guest's financial arrangements are funded by their own money, each year at a fixed time. We have to show a picture of our charge holding up that day's newspaper, the date and headline clearly visible, to the benefactor, much as kidnappers do with ransom victims. Even if on that day the guest is not particularly well, the set date is binding. But this, of course, is why our guests are so well looked after and kept as fit as possible. And um, so here we get an introduction to one of the uh, residents of Comrick. So, um, sitting on Sandra's left was a man with a thatch of long fair hair. Unlike everybody else, his clothes were informal. Dirty jeans with holes in the knees and old once white trainers. He was slim, hunched and small. It was impossible to gauge his years, partly because his blonde hair made him seem young, while the extraordinary mess that had once been his handsome face suggested the opposite. This was Kit Weston, three times Formula One world champion. Men and women alike had universally worshipped the faultlessly handsome racing driver, though for different reasons, and he had revelled in their adoration and the attention of the media. Then had come that final crash. Always a showboater, he'd taken one on track risk too many and ended up at the centre of a fireball. The ace racing driver had suffered 80% burns over his body as well as several bone fractures. He'd been put into a 10 day coma while the physicians worked on his burns, even his lungs were scorched. Later, when they brought him out of his coma, even the world's best cosmetic surgeons could do little to recover his film star looks. The intense heat had so deformed his skeleton and his musculature that he could walk only in small awkward steps, like a humpback toddler. Paradoxically, his yellow hair had regrown thicker and healthier than ever, like a fire-raised forest. It had been his idea to let the public think he'd died. He couldn't bear to face them ever again, literally because one of his once brilliantly blue eyes had become opaque and half the skin round his mouth had disintegrated, revealing brown rotting teeth. His request to be thought of as dead had to be scrawled on paper with a withered hand, for in the crash he had bitten off his tongue, leaving only a stump. For him. And then we get this um, delightfully gory part. Um, uh, James Herbert writes gore really well. It's one of the things I always like about his stuff. In sheer desperation, Ash pushed his free left hand into his assailant's snarling, brutish face. He thrust two stiffened fingers directly into the madman's right eye, wincing as they passed through the half-closed lids and pushed against the repugnant softness of the eyeball itself. Then beyond, his fingers slithered over the white globe until they reached harder matter behind. Lukovich screeched as blood gushed from the ruined eye socket, a sound amplified by the limited confines of the lift, and instinctively yanked his head backwards. But the tips of Ash's gore-sodden fingers had curled behind the eyeball, and when Lukovich pulled his head back, the eyeball popped as though sucked out and dropped against his upper cheek, held there only by thin bloody tendrils. Mmm. And then as if that wasn't bad enough, we then get this. He half turned, then drove his elbow back towards Lukovic's injured and exposed face, smashing it as hard as he could and crushing the dangling eyeball. We get a reference to Sir Oswald Mosley and his, and his black shirts, which appeared in 48, which is another James Herbert novel that I read not too long ago. And we get a reference to um, Prince William and Catherine's marriage, which I guess puts a kind of date on this book, but I mean, I thought James Herbert was dead before that happened, but I guess not. Oh, and then uh, David and uh, Delphine, the, the psychiatrist, they say that they love each other. And I'm like, you've literally known each other two days. Uh, and they say um, they can see the Mull of Kintyre, uh, like the song, uh, Mull of Kintyre by Paul McCartney. Someone does something lingeringly, which again, just bothers me. Oh, and then he... Um, find a file on Robert Maxwell and his yacht was called the Lady Ghislaine. So I'm guessing Robert Maxwell was Ghislaine Maxwell's father. I wonder what he would have made of all of this. And then we do get an acknowledgement. Uh, when, she full, when she finally pulled away, she said breathlessly, I love you, David. After two days, there was neither cynicism nor mockery in his response, only wonder. And we get the line, so much for Frankenstein and his pal Dracula, thunderstorms with boiling clouds and forked lightning, he thought. And uh, we should remember, Frankenstein was the creator, not the monster. We get um, a butler, he goes, alas, and, and Ash thinks, now there's a word you, don't, you didn't hear often these days. That's a weird use of tense. There's a word you didn't hear often these days. Should be don't, or didn't hear often in those days. Uh, and then one of the quotes I like to hear, um, I could cheerfully shoot the guy who wrote those bloody horror books about rats, said Ash mildly, and obviously, that was James Herbert who did it, so his own character wishes wish he could, wish he could shoot him, which I thought was funny. Um, and then finally, the other thing I wanted to mention is that Ash gives somebody a piggyback, and this, you know, he asks this kid what he wants. Do you want me to give you a fireman's lift or a piggyback? And uh, the guy responds with piggyback. But the thing is, is that he's been 
basically kept away from society since he was a baby in like a dungeon. So how the hell does he know what a piggyback is? Anyway, uh, Ash by James Herbert is pretty good, haunting novel, kind of continues in the vein of the other books in the series. It might be the best of the three, um, but I do think it was a, a little on the long side. I mean, it was about 700 pages. It probably could have been 600, maybe even 550, and it would have the pacing would have been better. But there are some good bits in it as well. Um, overall, I am glad I read it. I gave it like a middle of the road 3.5 out of 5, but thought it was okay. Uh, the David Ash books just definitely, in general, aren't my favourite of Herbert's books, but they are worth reading if you're a James Herbert fan. So there we have it. That's what I made of Ash by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.